So I'd like to talk today about um, the first low-mass pre-main sequence eclipsing binary, which shows evidence for having a circumbinary disk. Just briefly, eclipsing binaries are simply standard binary stars that are special only because of their orientation, i.e. that we see one star pass periodic periodically in front of the other, giving drops in the amount of light observed. Now I'm going to focus today on a system that is detached and double-lined, by which I mean that the two stars are well separated, interacting only via, sorry, interacting only via stellar winds and also potentially large-scale magnetic fields and by double-lined, I mean that you can see the spectral features of both stars. Now, with a system such as this, from photometry and spectroscopy, you can determine the masses and radii to a precision of a few percent or less, and assuming curvality and shared metallicity, this allows you to place powerful observational constraints on models of stellar evolution. So here I'm showing the mass-radius relation for detached eclipsing binaries below 1.5 solar masses. With the... Uh, pre-main sequence models of Barafatel from one million year in brown to 10 million year in cyan, and then the black line here is indicating the location of the main sequence. Now the key point here is that while there are many observational constraints on the main sequence, there are very few on the, on the pre-main sequence. Now each of these systems is valuable, and the lack of them is well known, and was one of the key reasons that led Coro to observe the three million year NGC 2264 star forming region back in 2008. So this is the Coro light curve of the system that I'm gonna be talking about. And you can see relatively deep eclipses on both the primary and secondary stars. But what I want to draw your attention to here is this rather unusual out of eclipse variability. Now the amplitude and evolutionary timescale of this variability is very difficult to reproduce with just star spot modulation alone. Now I'm gonna come back to this later, but for now, I want to focus on the eclipses themselves. Now, as John told us, there's a wealth of information that you can, that, that's contained within the eclipses, but to get at it in a system like this, we first need to model and account for the out of eclipse variability. And we do this using Gaussian processes. Now you can think of a Gaussian process as a way of uh, modeling the light curve by parameterizing the covariance between pairs of flux measurements, rather than explicitly specifying an expression for the fluxes themselves. Now the red line and the pink shaded region show you the mean and standard deviation of the GP's posterior predictive distribution. And we can use this to remove the out of eclipse variability and also propagate the uncertainties in this process through to our residual light curve. And it's upon this light curve that we then subsequently model the eclipses using JKT BOP. So here I'm showing the phase folded light curve with the JKT BOP model in red, residuals below, and then zooms on primary and secondary eclipses. And you can see that firstly the model is a good fit to the data but also that there's increased scatter around the eclipses. Now this is primarily due to spots on the background star that are crossed by the foreground star during an eclipse. Doing this kind of analysis gives you a wealth of information, but the key point here is that, as John mentioned, a lot of it is in the form of ratios or combination terms. And so you need additional complementary information to solve for the masses and radii. And this comes from spectra. So firstly, we took a low-resolution spectrum to determine the combined spectral type, which is M2. So it tells us we're dealing with low-mass stars. And then we took medium-resolution spectroscopy, cross-correlated with high-resolution Marx model spectra to create cross-correlation functions like this one here. Now, the cross-correlation function is made up of two stellar peaks in the center, but also there's some fairly significant correlated noise. And we want to model this noise at the same time as fitting for the peaks to ensure that we determine as accurately as possible the radial velocities of the two stars. And so what we do is we model each CCF as the sum of two Gaussians plus a stochastic noise term, which is described by a Gaussian process. Doing this for each of our spectra allows us to get radial velocities at different points in the orbits of the two stars and enables us to map out the motion of each star around their common center of mass. 
So here I'm showing the phase-folded radial velocity curve of the system, the primary in red, secondary in blue. And then we model the radial velocities with constraints from our light curve solution to ensure that we remain consistent with all of the available information. We note that the systemic velocity of the system, which is shown by the gray line here, is in agreement with the cluster's recessional velocity, which is an indication that it's kinematically associated with the star-forming region. Now, in addition, we see that H-alpha is in emission. There's also lithium absorption, and we take this as strong evidence for firstly cluster membership, but also that the system is young. So now we have all of the information that we need to solve for the fundamental parameters. So the masses here tell us that we're dealing with a 0 0.5, 0 0.7 and a 0.5 solar mass system. And what I want to draw your attention to is that the radii are relatively large compared to their masses, which tells you it's a low surface gravity, we're dealing with low surface gravity stars, and in this case, that they're young. So now we can go back to the mass radius relation I showed you at the beginning and plot this system. So the first thing to note is that they're relatively small error bars, which really shows you the power of space photometry. Second, it lies in a relatively sparsely populated region of the diagram, highlighting uh, its use and importance in constraining these models of stellar evolution. Now, if we're going to use a system like this to constrain these models, we want to compare to more than just one, we want to compare to many of them. So in the next plot, we're going to zoom in on this region here, and compare to five sets of pre-main sequence models. So here we have against the Barafatal models, the Detona and Mazzatelli models, Sysatal, the Dartmouth models of Dotteretal, and the PISA models of Tognelli et al. So the system here is, is well fit by most of these models. So the majority of these models are able to fit a single isochrone through both the primary and secondary stars. As seen with, with some other systems, the primary appears to be on an ever so slightly younger isochrone than the secondary, which is usually attributed in a close binary system to a tidal interaction which enhances magnetic activity, inhibits convection, and so for the star to cool and maintain hydrostatic equilibrium, it needs to expand. And so as John mentioned, we tend to observe puffier, larger stars than we would expect from the models. But in the present case, this isn't really that significant. It's only at less than 1.5 sigma level. Now, the system here is, is kind of has an apparent age of about 5 million years, which is shown by the green line here. So we know that the system is young. And we also saw from the out-of-eclipse variability in the light curve that it would be fairly difficult to explain it just with spot modulation. And so the natural question is, because the system is young, is, is there any additional material in the system? And to answer this question, we created spectral energy distribution. So here I'm showing uh, UGRIS data, JHK, and Spitzer IRAC data. Now we first sought to explain the SED simply by emission from two naked stellar photospheres. But we find that there's a bit of an excess in the infrared here. And the model to try and account for this is pushing itself up and degrading the fit around one micron. And so we next sought to just model the UGRIS and JHK data and we find that the, the infrared excess is slightly more, more apparent, and it might seem fairly, fairly low level, but at eight microns here, it's more than 10 sigma discrepant. So in a young system, you might expect circumstellar disks around the primary and secondary stars, and also a circumbinary disk around both stars. Circumstellar disks in this system, the emission from them would peak around about one micron but we don't see any excess here. And we find that we can model this excess with emission from dust within the central cavity of a circumbinary disk. And so to give you a brief a kind of a feeling for what we think we're dealing with here, is a schematic of the, uh, of the system geometry with the primary star and circumprimary disk in red, same for the secondary, disk, secondary star in blue, and the circumbinary disk 
truncated to the theoretical inner edge, which is about twice the separation of the binary, and we think we're seeing emission from roughly where these green dots are. Now, unfortunately, we only have relative, oh, sorry. Yet the mass of dust required is actually very low, so it's about 10 to the minus 13 solar masses. Now, this is consistent with what you might expect. So it's consistent with what you might expect um, from accretion streams uh, from a circumbinary disk. Now, unfortunately, we can't directly uh, detect the presence of a circumbinary disk because we only have relatively weak uh, upper limits further redward than the IRAC data. And the expected emission from a circumbinary disk in this system lies significantly lower. So we can't directly uh, detect the presence of a circumbinary disk, but such a disk would certainly be required to replenish the dust in the cavity because this dust has a uh, the lifetime in the cavity essentially akin to the freefall time. So now we know that we have extra material in the system, we can go back to the light curve and see if this helps our understanding at all. So the first thing to note is that there seems to be a fairly different morphology in the first half of the light curve compared to the second half of the light curve. The second half has this quasi-periodic sinusoidal variations that aren't too dissimilar to what you might expect from star spots. And so the first thing we tried to do was remove the eclipses and model the second half of the out of eclipse variability with a simple star spot model, which is shown here. So we can model the second half of the light curve fairly well. And we require fairly large, fairly large spots, typically about 20% of, uh, of the primary star. But this isn't too uh, unusual for what you might expect for young, young stars such as this. But the key point here is that you would need rapid spot evolution between the first and second halves of the light curve if you're just going to try and explain this simply as spot evolution. Now, given that we know there's extra material in the system, and because of the eclipsing nature of the system that we're viewing very close to edge on, we wondered whether we might be seeing obscuration of one or both stars by material at the inner edge or in the central cavity of the circumbinary disk. Unfortunately, we can't answer this question simply with a single band light curve that we have from Coro, but fortunately, the system was reobserved simultaneously with both Coro and Spitzer. So here I'm showing the out of eclipse light curves of uh, Coro and Spitzer 3.6 and 4.5, which are vertically offset for clarity. <coughs> now, if we focus in on the Coro light curve, again, we can see there's fairly large amplitude variations, but also shorter amplitude. Uh, quicker variations as well. And we can play a similar kind of game and fit the large amplitude variations with a simple star spot model. And we find that we, fairly similar parameters, 15% spot coverage, we can recreate the amplitudes that we see in, in the light curve. But again, there's evolution in the light curve that's not well fit by the spot model and the morphology isn't quite right. But we can now see what such a spot would look like in the Spitzer bands. And again, we Kind of, we get the right kind of amplitudes, but the morphology isn't correct. So what else could be causing these variations? Well, if there's accretion that's ongoing, then you might expect hotspot on one, on one or both of the stars, which would give similar kind of modulation to the uh, cold spot in the, in the optical Coro band, but fairly negligible, much smaller amplitude variations in the infrared Spitzer bands. Now, similarly to this, you might expect if there is any dust obscuration, it will behave in a similar way to a hotspot, i.e. they will give large variations in the optical, but fairly negligible variations in the infrared, so that wavelengths longer than you expect the size of the dust to be. And we also know from SED modeling that we require dust emission. Um, and so we can, we can see what dust emission would look like, and I'm going to show it here with the, uh, with the green arrows. So this time I fit the Spitzer 4.5 light curve amplitude with emission, variable emission from dust. <coughs> and again, we get kind of the right amplitude in the 3.6, but basically negligible amplitude in the Coro bands. So the key point here is that there's no one kind of variability that seems able to reproduce all of the light curve, all of the variability in the light curve. So this plot has become quite messy, and it's quite difficult to get a feel for, for what exactly is going on. So I'm going to propose that we move to the color magnitude plane to try and get a better feel for this. But I want you to, to still remember the, uh, the blue is for a cold spot, 
red is for a hotspot and green is for, for dust emission because I'm going to use the same colors and same arrows in the color magnitude plane. So here we have uh, Coro versus Coro minus 3.6, Coro versus Coro minus 4.5, and 3.6 versus 3.6 minus 4.5. The dashed gray line shows a least squares fit, which is simply to, to help guide your eyes. And the typical error bars uh, on each plot are also shown in the bottom left. The directions and amplitudes of these arrows show you how far and in what direction you would move for each of the uh, different kinds of variability. So for the cold spot here, the hot spot in red, and then d dust emission in green. There's enough scatter in, in the data points above and beyond what you would expect from the, from the uh, formal errors on each, on each data point to suggest that you can't simply explain this with either cold spots or a hot spot or dust emission. You need some combination of them. But with the data that we currently have, it's difficult to say exactly what could be causing the variations. So to conclude, we have a, a very unique low-mass pre-main sequence eclipsing binary, and we've solved the fundamental parameters using Gaussian process regression methods, which allows us to co help constrain a fairly sparsely populated region of the diagram. And the system also has evidence for a circumbinary disk, which we, uh, we infer from indirect measurements of dust emission within the central cavity. And this is uh, written up in a, a paper we published earlier this year. Now, delta eclipse variability is quite difficult to, to explain simply with one form of variability. It looks like we need more than, more than one kind. But exactly what it is is difficult to constrain with the data we have currently. And a note towards the future, as we heard from, from Martin yesterday, K2 has been approved and will observe a number of star forming regions over the next couple of years. And so this will help us hopefully find more pre-main sequence eclipsing binaries and really help constrain the mass radius relation for, for early, early periods. And also we could potentially find planets around young stars, such as Davide was talking about earlier in the week, which would be very, very interesting for both star and planet formation scenarios. I'll finish there, thank you. Thank you, Ed, for that interesting talk, Simon. The age that you found for the, uh, for the stars was about 5 million years, I thought, from the, for the isochrones. But yeah. of course, these are pre-main sequence stars. Exactly, yeah. Um, so my question is, what's the zero point of the age scale? It obviously isn't the uh, onset of hydrogen fusion in the core. No, so you mean for the pre-main sequence models? Yeah. <coughs> so they have a, I think they have a fairly arbitrary starting point. So it's like very, very early on, but each set of models starts slightly differently. So the early stages of stellar evolution are really where you get discrepancies between the models, and that's really where you want to be constraining, so the very early stages. So on the main sequence, things are slightly better, but the pre-main sequence, the observations and the models are in disagreement. So the system I showed you is actually one of the better agreeing systems to the models, but certainly for some of the early systems around a million years, there are very large discrepancies. So for one of the systems, I can sort of skip back. Um, <coughs> so for this system here, you can see that neither the primary or the secondary will, will fit the same isochrone. Right? Substantially, it's substantially different. Um, here, the temperature of the secondary was found to be higher than the temperature of the primary, which obviously doesn't agree with any of the, any of the models. So there's lots of discrepancies, and so it's really this early stage that is key to key to helping our understanding of how, st how stars evolve. Okay, Louis. Yeah, this is obviously a very active system, and I would have thought to see, I would have expected to see some flaring activity. Have you looked for flares? No, so, I mean, I can show you the light curve again. So let's, uh, okay. Um, so from, from the light curve here, I mean, I'm not an expert in flares, so I don't know exactly what you would expect to see, like sort of signatures that would be tell you it's flares and nothing else. But there's nothing that jumps out at, at me as saying this has to be a flare. And so, I, my kind of take on it is that unless you have a good evidence for it, you would look for the simplest explanations. 
which would be cold spot modulation. If you have evidence for accretion, maybe hot spot modulation. So we, we know from the SED there's, there's dust in the, uh, in the vicinity of the two stars, and so you might have variable dust emission. And it could be that there are, is flaring going on, but at the moment I haven't seen evidence for it, so we haven't considered that yet. But it's definitely something to, to think about, yeah. I'm sorry, actually, I understood the observational constraint from the presence of these testities that you've shown, but I couldn't understand the presence of this outer circumbinary disk that you uh, depicted ah, yes. in the okay. cartoon, actually. So, um, so you mean you understand how we get this bit here, but not, not this? The, the outer circumbinary yeah, so we don't have a direct constraint on the circumbinary disk. So our, our, kind of, our theory is that we have dust in the cavity of the circumbinary disk, but to have that dust still there at five million years, it needs to be replenished. Because once dust enters the, the cavity, it will fall onto the star, essentially in the free fall time. And so to have dust there, it needs to be replenished from something. And the simplest explanation to, to keep dust in the cavity here is to have something outside it replenishing it, which would be a circumbinary disk. But you're right, we don't directly constrain the presence of the circumbinary disk. It's inferred from the fact that we have dust in the cavity. Okay, could we thank Ed once more?